Hello everyone, welcome back to AS Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in today's video I will be taking you through nucleic acids and protein synthesis. Now this is the sixth chapter of the AS Biology syllabus. So what I have done is I have split it into two. So you will see on the list of videos that there's chapter 6.1 and 6.2. This is 6.1 and what this will simply tell you is about nucleic acids and DNA replication while the next one will tell you about protein synthesis in more detail. If you have any questions from watching any of the videos, feel free to post a comment and I promise to get back to you as soon as possible. So if you've been watching my videos from the beginning, you probably watched a video, chapter 2.1, where I discussed biological molecules. And in that video, I showed you this and I said, remember foam. Form meaning fatty acids, organic bases, amino acids, and monosaccharides. These are the monomers for all of these polymers that are listed at the bottom. So to make lipids, for example, you would need to add fatty acids to glycerol. If you want to make amino acids, if you want to make proteins rather, you would add uh, repeating units of many amino acids. And if you want to make polysaccharides, you would add repeating units of monosaccharides together. For this chapter, you're really focusing here on organic bases, which are used to make nucleic acids. And that is what I intend to show you in this video. First thing you have to bear in mind is that when we speak about nucleic acids, there are two nucleic acids that are central to the human body and to basically the organism's function, not just the human body. And that is DNA and RNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, while RNA is ribonucleic acid. This means that DNA contains the sugar deoxyribose. I'm just going to try to write that here, um, deoxyribose, while RNA has um, simply ribose, um, the sugar. These are five carbon sugars, um, and they make up the genetic materials in our body. Something else for you to see is that RNA is often is just a single-stranded um, nucleic acid, while DNA has a double helix structure. So it is made up of two strands that are wound around each other. Another interesting thing to see here is that DNA and RNA seem to be made up of the same bases except for one. So both DNA and RNA have a base called cytosine. There's another one called guanine adenine but when you get to the bottom here where it says timing for dna timing um, in rna is uracil this means that uracil is replaced by timing in rna something important to learn here and why this is so key is that it tells you how how these bases bind to each other for example cytosine will always bind to guanine cytosine and guanine always bind to each other whether they are in rna or in dna in RNA, adenine will always bind to uracil, while in DNA, adenine binds to thymine. So wherever you have DNA, say, for example, let me write um, a short DNA strand here. So let's say we have a DNA strand that's AAT, um, CGA, um, and let's say TAC. This is completely made up, by the way, so this doesn't necessarily code for anything. If this is a DNA strand, first things first, the way you know this is DNA is because you can see T there. T stands for timing, A stands for adenine, um, C stands for cytosine, and G for guanine. If we had to take this DNA strand and convert it to an RNA, the adenine would be binding to U, so the complementary base there would be U, and that means this would be another U. Thymine would bind to adenine, so that's A. Cytosine will bind to guanine. Guanine will bind to cytosine. Adenine will bind to uracil again. Um, thymine will bind to adenine. And adenine will go to uracil again. And cytosine will go to guanine. So this would be what the RNA strand looks like. It would be UUA, GCU, AUG. So that is just to let you know how we can transcribe from DNA to RNA and how these different bases play a role in what your RNA strand looks like. If you are unsure that you're looking at an RNA strand, again, always just look at the bases. If you see a uracil in the strand of bases, 
that means you are dealing with RNA. And if you see a timing, so that's if you see T, that means you are dealing with DNA. Now, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, and uracil all fall under different groups, or they fall under two key groups. You have the purines. The purines are adenine and guanine. And you can see here that they have two ring structures. So they're quite different um, from these ones here that only have one ring structure. And these are the pyrimidines. The pyrimidines are thymine, cytosine, and uracil. I have often seen questions in CIE past papers where students are asked to identify if they are looking at a um, pyrimidine or a purine. So it is important for you to know the difference between these two structures. It is also important for you to see that with the pyrimidines, they all have at least one double bonded oxygen, um, double bound oxygen rather attached to them. This one has two, that's uracil. Thymine also has two, cytosine has only one. Um, when you look at guanine, only guanine has that, adenine doesn't. Uh, but the key difference that you're able to see off the start is just looking at the ring structures. That helps you to remember very clearly which one you are looking at. So now let's get into the core of it, DNA replication. DNA replication is a very important process that happens as your cells start to divide. It is important because it ensures that every cell has the same copy of DNA and in doing that preserves your genetic identity. DNA is copied in what we call a semi-conservative process. And what that means is that when we are done copying the DNA, half of the new DNA strand will consist of the original DNA molecule. Don't stretch too much if that sounds a little bit difficult because I will explain this process in detail. But it is important for you to know that DNA replication is a semi-conservative process and it requires unwinding of the DNA and a whole lot of enzymes that ensure that the process is started um, and completed as it should be. So now let's get into the process of DNA replication. First thing you have to know is that when we say DNA replication, it means copying the DNA. And the reason why we need to copy the DNA is again because all our cells must contain the same information. This is very important as you will see for protein synthesis because if all the cells contain very different information, then it means your body would manufacture different proteins that don't necessarily serve the function that you need. But you'll see more of that in the next uh, video, which is chapter 6.2. Now, if you remember the structure of DNA, it's basically two strands, right, that are wound around each other. I'm not doing a great job of this over here. Um, drawing is just not a talent that I have. But you can see that it's two strands that are wound around each other. And if we want to copy these two strands to make new DNA, we then have to separate them. We have to open them up. And that is where this enzyme called helicase comes into the picture. Helicase binds to the DNA and it unwinds it. That's the function of helicase. It unwinds the DNA double strand and it then opens it up into two separate strands that can now be copied. When helicase unwinds DNA, the two strands don't have the same direction. The leading strand, which is this one at the bottom over here on this image, it says leading stand, but that's leading strand. The leading strand on this DNA here means that the DNA goes from a direction of three prime to five prime. And this is going to be important as we go along. Um, it simply just tells us the direction that DNA polymerase moves in. The lagging strand goes from five prime to three prime. So it basically runs in the opposite direction to the leading strand, even though they are bound together. So once helicase has unwound them, and we now have our two strands, one being the leading strand and the other one being the lagging strand, the next step is for an enzyme called primase. Primase comes and binds to the DNA helix, and what it does is it would add primers so primers are simply nucleotides. So they're just short sections of nucleotides to bind to the DNA. And the point of these nucleotides is that they allow the next enzyme, which is DNA polymerase, to bind. So primase adds RNA primers, or you can just call them RNA bases, um, to the DNA. DNA polymerase would then bind to that. So think about it this way. Here is 
the strand of um, DNA we want to copy, this line I have drawn at the bottom here. And for us to be able to copy it, we need DNA polymerase to be binding on top here and adding bases right down at the bottom. But DNA polymerase cannot just bind in thin air and it can't hang in thin air. So what primase does is that it comes and it adds some nucleotides here. And what these nucleotides then do is they provide a binding spot for DNA polymerase to attach, and then it can go on with DNA nucleotides to be added to the strand. And so it, that way it starts to copy this DNA strand that is at the bottom here. So I'm drawing an arrow to it there. So it starts to copy that because primase would simply just move in that direction. On the leading strand, the DNA polymerase moves on continuously. It doesn't stop. It just goes on continuously, so it's very quick. It's like zipping up a dress. Think about it that way. The zip just goes up, zzz, and that's it, right? There are no stops. Then there's nothing wrong. Um, so DNA polymerase, because its natural move is from 3' prime to 5', prime, it is able to do that um, with ease. The story is a little bit different on the lagging strand. On the lagging strand, because the lagging strand runs from 5' prime to 3', prime, the DNA polymerase is unable to move with ease in that direction. So what it does is that it will attach to the primers, but it will only add DNA nucleotides in small fragments. So those fragments are called Okazaki fragments. So the primer comes and it makes its nucleotides and the DNA polymerase would again come and bind and it adds little sections and then the primer would come again and it adds more little sections and it goes on and on like that. So on the lagging strand, think about it as trying to zip up a dress, but this, uh, the zipper is not so great. So you zip it up a bit and then something gets stuck and then you have to maybe go down a little bit, zip it up again and do all of these gymnastics in order for the zip to work. Um, that is simply what the DNA replication on the lagging strand feels like or looks like. In other words, from five prime to three prime, DNA polymerase will start to move in this backwards direction. And in doing that, it just adds in small fragments on the lagging strand. That is why it is called the lagging strand. It is important for you to remember the Okazaki fragment. Now, once all of these nucleotides have been added, um, so once the DNA polymerase has worked on the lagging strand and the leading strand, a new enzyme called ligase will come and seal the gaps. So remember that we started with RNA primers. So these RNA primers, once all the rest of the DNA has been copied, the RNA primers will be removed and replaced with DNA. The same thing will happen on the leading strand, and then you will have ligase that comes and makes sure there are no gaps between the DNA strand. So it seals all of the gaps. And what would then happen as a result of that, let's look at it this way. I'm just going to draw here by the heading. So we had one DNA, um, two DNA strands that were separated for, being, um, for our replication process, right? So we come here, this is our leading strand, we make a new strand over here. So these are bound to each other. Now, because we've made a new strand, um, I'm just going to call this over here strand A, and this was strand B, right? Because it was bound to A before. Now we've made a new strand, that is strand C, and over here we've also made another new strand, and that is strand D. What you will see, so let's say that our initial strands were both A and B, right? So A and B were bound together, they then got separated, and then we made new copies um, by just replicating the bases that they had. And so what you will see here is that from the original strand, we've now preserved um, one half. So one half of the original strand, which is A over here, is now in this new strand called AC, while the other strand, which is B from the original, is now in a new strand called, in a new helix rather, called BD. And so this is why we say it is semi-conservative, because it, it keeps one half of the original um, in the new strand that is being made. Some of you might ask, what is the purpose of this enzyme here called topoisomerase? Because usually when I show this to students, students can see helicase, they understand primase, they get the point of the RNA primer, um, they also understand DNA polymerase, but what is topoisomerase? Topoisomerase is simply an enzyme that prevents the DNA from overwinding. 
So once the copying is done, the DNA strands now have to wind back together, um, the new strands that is. Um, and that, that can become a problem because sometimes DNA can become tightly wound and that can create problems. And so topoisomerase prevents it from being overwound or being underwound. And so that just ensures that it has the perfect winding pattern and the DNA is well preserved. So this is DNA replication in a nutshell. I'm going to show you here again, just to um, help you understand a little bit better how this works with bases. So let's say that we have a DNA strand that is A, um, A, T, A, and um, let's say we have G, T, T, um, and then we have A, T, T over here. And this is just one half of the strand. So this is one strand, but obviously DNA is a double helix, right? So we're going to say over here that this is bound to T, um, A, because remember adenine always binds to thymine, thymine to adenine, adenine again to thymine, guanine to cytosine, thymine to adenine, thymine to adenine again, adenine to thymine, and then thymine to adenine over there. So this now is our helix. This is a section of DNA. This is the original strand. Now we want to copy this helix. We want to replicate it to make new DNA. It means that we would copy this part over here. I'm just going to draw a line between the two of them. And we will copy this part over here. So this part will become TAT, just like the bottom one, really. And then this becomes CAA, right? And this becomes TAA. So what we've basically done is that even though we've unwound the DNA, we have copied the exact strand it was bound to. And over here, when you do the same thing here, you would get the exact strand it was bound to. And this is how DNA doesn't change if you catch the drift. DNA doesn't change. Your DNA doesn't, um, it mutates. There can be mutations in this process. And that's something you will learn about as you go deeper in biology. But the process of it is that when you do DNA replication, the DNA in a way is basically making copies of itself. And as a result of that, preserving your genetic identity. I hope this has been helpful. It's a little bit longer than I planned for it to be. But I hope that all the annotations have been very helpful in helping you understand. If you have any questions or you feel like something was just completely unclear please by all means post a video um post a comment uh in the comment section and i promise to get back to you as soon as possible thank you for watching until the next video have a good time